Assalamu alaikum brothers, sisters and friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the GDM show, the Global Dawah Movement show. We're here with brother Hamza. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you bro? Good, very good. Alhamdulillah, good to see you. How are you? Likewise, I'm very, very good. Jazakallah khair. And nice to see you again as well, mashallah. So recently, we've been discussing some very, very interesting topics on the GDM show. We've been covering the philosophy of science, the limitations of science. We've also been looking at scientific miracles in the Quran, understanding the nature of science, then can we claim that there are scientific miracles in the Quran? Yes. And we've disproven this idea, we've broken it down for people in a very digestible way so they can yes. understand it. They and we provided it. a new approach. Yes, of course, we provided a beautiful new approach. The multi-layered and multi-leveled approach. Which is actually the orthodox approach. Yes. And we call it the new approach, so because we're introducing it as something new and many people aren't aware of it, basically. So today what I want to do is cover a few common contentions which have been raised regarding this because we've touched upon the philosophy of science and we've said science is inductive it can't induction can't lead us to 100 percent truth yes induction cannot lead us to certainty we yep. mentioned this previously in other gdm shows because it moves from the particular to the general from the observed to the unobserved yep. so there can always be a future observation that can deny previous conclusions or change previous mm. conclusions okay so understanding this some people have raised some uh, contentions which we're going to address today which you're going to address today number one the question has been raised well look we've got verses in the quran which allude to natural phenomena we speak about natural phenomena isn't allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraging us to do induction or use the inductive method of reasoning in these verses yeah, that's that's actually a very very good question it shows that the questioner has understood what we're saying or at least the concepts yeah. now there are ayat which means signs indicators signposts verses essentially verses in the quran that refer to natural phenomena for example the quran says have you not seen the camel and how it was created do not the disbelievers see how we separated the heavens and the earth and we created everything from water yep. every living thing from water so you have all of these verses ayat that point towards natural phenomena mm. some argue do not these verses encourage induction they're making you have a set of observations a limited set of observations to conclude for the unobserved yep. because the whole point of these verses is for you to conclude that God exists and specifically and significantly God deserves to be worshipped. So isn't God actually telling you to do induction in the first place? Yes, yep. Have your limited observations and you will conclude that God exists and He deserves to be worshipped. Actually this is not true at all. If you understand the primary reason for these ayat the primary reasons for these ayat, you will see that they're not induction, inductive in nature at all. For example, these ayat, these verses, act as trigger points to wake up the fitra, the innate disposition, to make us realize what we already know. Right. So it's not moving from the particular to the general. It's not moving from a set of limited observations to the unobserved. Okay. It's actually moving from using a particular argument based on your observations to awaken what you already know, what's self evidently true. Right, okay. Which is not an inductive argument okay. because it doesn't have the same limitations as an inductive argument. There's not, for example, a future observation that would deny that self evident truth. Right. It's already self-evident. So all, all what these ayat do is just wake up that self-evident reality that God exists and He deserves to be worshipped. Let me give an example. When I was around three years old, I think maybe a little, little older, I used to love Donald Duck. Okay. Right? Right? Is that similar? Yeah, now, now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Donald Duck, right? And I had this kind of plastic Donald Duck doll thing, right? And... That was when I was three years old, around that age. Now, moving on, about 32 years, say, for example, I go to my mother's house, I go to the basement, and I start clearing up. Yeah. And I forgot what was my favorite toy, and who it was, and what cartoon character it represented. So I'm cleaning up, I'm moving things away and bags away, and I find the Donald Duck toy. I move the dust, what happens to me? <sighs> oh yeah, that was my favorite toy. Oh my God, it's Donald Duck. 
So what that what does what what just has happened in this example is that me observing, which is a limited observation of the Donald Duck, it uh, it has acted like a trigger point for me to realize what my favorite toy was. It was right. already known. Do you see? Yeah. So it's not moving from particular to, particular to the general. It's like meeting a long lost friend mm. that you haven't seen for like 20 years and you forgot his name. You, you just probably don't remember what they look like. But you're in Paris, for example, and you're having some nice coffee. And then you see your friend. And you're like, hold on a second. That guy's face reminds me of somebody. <gasps> oh, yeah. It's exactly. one of my best friends could join when we were in primary school. So you've used a limited observation and it's acting acted like a trigger point to awaken what's already there basically. what's already there what's right. already self-evidently true because there is i don't want to claim that we have one way of understanding this or there's one conception of islamic epistemology but this is one that we're currently adopting which is that there are self-evident truths in the right. quran if you really have a good newest academic study of the quran you see that the quran has implies these self-evident truths namely that god exists and that he deserves to be worshipped and we're going to have a future GDM GDM show on the self-evident truth. This is the, called the fitra from the Islamic perspective. Yeah, it's called the fitra. We have an innate disposition called the fitra, coming from the Arabic triliteral stem, fatara, which you have words like fatron and fatarahu, which essentially means that God, Allah, has created something within us to acknowledge Him and worship Him. Mm. And, and this is the innate disposition. And the innate disposition understands these self-evident truths. Now, from a Quranic perspective, all the souls actually acknowledge that Allah was their Lord. Yeah. Right? We are already acknowledged. So everything we experience in the kind of worldly domain, whether it's limited or unlimited observations, well, you can't have unlimited observations, yeah. limited observations, they, they're not there for you to conclude for an unknown, or for you to conclude for a general that you haven't experienced. But rather, they're there to, to act as trigger points to awaken the fitra that understands the self-evident reality that God exists and He deserves to right. be worshipped. That sums up. That's an ayah. Excellent. I think that you've summed up very, very well with those, especially those that Donald Duck analogy really sort of cleared this in my mind. So it's almost like you see it and it's not that you're learning something new from it. It just awakens what's already in self-evidently true. Okay, because when you study the Quran, when it, when it tells you to look into the cosmos and look into nature, it always concludes, therefore God exists or essentially God deserves to be worshipped. Yep. Yep. So you see that these verses are there for a particular purpose, yes. which is to awaken that fact. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so moving on swiftly to the second point. Again, based on the whole induction uh, aspect, the questions asked, well, what about the preservation of the Quran and Hadith? Isn't that an inductive process in itself? Yes. Well, that's actually wrong because when we talk about induction, we say it moves from the limited to the general. Yep. It moves from the particular to the general, the limited observations to an unknown, mm -hmm. right? What's interesting about the preservation of the Quran and Hadith, they don't suffer from those limitations because there is a form of inductive reasoning mm -hmm. and there is a difference between inductive arguments and inductive reasoning, but let's not discuss that for now. Sure. But there is a form of using induction that can lead to certainty. Okay. For example, I have observed a thousand black crows. My conclusion, therefore, some crows are black. That's the same. That's conclusion. necessarily true. That's not an inductive argument. Mm -hmm. That's deductive because the conclusion is necessary. Yes. Yep. If you've seen a set of crows, a limited set of crows, and some, and they're all black, then you can conclude that some crows are black. Mm -hmm. And that would lead to certainty. You can't say now all crows are black. You've just seen a limited number of crows. You're not crows. inducing anymore. You're not you? inducing anymore, exactly. So from this perspective, using inductive reasoning, your observation, you can have some certainties. Okay. But it doesn't really give you new knowledge. You're just mirroring what you've seen. So how does this apply to the Quran? Well, exactly. Because that's what happens with the Quran. When a Sahabi, when a companion of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace, okay. he heard, for instance, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all grateful praise and thanks belongs to God. He didn't conclude, therefore, Alif, la, meem. Yeah. Right? He didn't give an, another verse that was unknown. He just repeated what he heard. So he's saying, al, for example, he's saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Yep. Therefore, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So he's just saying what he's heard exactly. He's like saying, A, therefore, A. Yep. That's, that's certain. It's like saying, I see a pen. 
therefore I there see is, a pen. There's one pen here. Well, That's exactly. Pen. You know, That's you're not exactly inducing right. that there must be ten pens in a box. Uh, exactly. And this is exactly the same for hadith. Right. So when someone heard a hadith or he read a hadith, he would say, I read so and so. I heard so and so. He's not saying I heard or read this hadith, this prophetic tradition. Plus this. Therefore, here's another new prophetic tradition yeah. that I'm unaware of. No, that he didn't induce anything. Right. He just He's just mirroring his knowledge. A, therefore A. Right. That's simple. what it is. That's very, very simple. So just to summarize, finally, the final thing I want to touch upon is, well, if we're understanding these realities, how should we understand these verses in which Allah speaks about the natural phenomena, speaks about the creation of the heavens and the earth, and so on and so forth? What's the way we should understand these verses? Well, that's a very good question. We've addressed this in previous GDM Global Dao Movement shows. Two shows concerning the so-called scientific miracles of the Quran, and we articulated what we call the new, but it's really the orthodox approach on how un how to understand natural phenomena in the Quran. Yep. But I think we should just look at it from another perspective as well. Consider the main purpose of ayat or verses referring to natural phenomena. There may be a few, but let's focus on two. The first one is that when God refers to natural phenomena, it's there to make you realize that there is eternal wisdom permeating the universe. There's an infinite wisdom permeating the universe because you don't know, for example, how God really created the camel or how God created us human beings from an alaqa which can maybe mean a blood clot or something that clings or a leech or a worm. We don't know maybe what that really means because yeah. we don't have the totality of, God, of God's wisdom and we don't know how God used the physical causes in the universe in order to establish His will. Mm. And eat, well, we may know a little bit but our scientific knowledge always changes. Yeah. But we would never really know the total wisdom of yeah. God which should create within us a sense of awe that God deserves to be worshipped. So that's the spiritual dimension of reflecting on these things that you see that I, I have the fragmentary pieces of knowledge. God has the to 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 totality of knowledge. Yeah. God has the picture. I just have the pixel. And you should be in awe and say, Allah deserves to be worshipped. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one way of look at looking at it. <coughs> Another way of looking at it is basically for you to understand that you have no knowledge at all, which is really similar. Is to be like, well, I have no clue. It's to show you that I don't have God's wisdom. If I don't have God's wisdom, then who should I refer to? Me or God? Yeah. Right? Another way of looking at these ayat is from an existential, meaning what it means to exist, a psychological and spiritual perspective. Let's consider, for example, an alaka. You, if you consider one of the meanings to be a blood clot, well, it looks like a bloody fleshy thing, right? At a certain stage. Now, forget the science. It's not supposed to give you details. Think about the spiritual aspect. You'd be like, wow, how on earth did I get from that to this? How? So, you know, I, I should be humble. This is who I was. This was this, these were my origins. This should be on my Facebook profile, right? It should humble you. Yeah. And humbleness and breaking the ego brings you closer to God. Mm. And ego is a barrier to God's mercy and guidance, right? And also, when you think of you were, were an alaka, you see that actually there are so many other dependencies outside of myself that this bloody mess, for instance, depended upon in order for me to grow up like the way I am now. So therefore, I should be humble and I should be thankful and I should be thankful specifically to my own mother because this bloody mess essentially or this fleshy bloody thing was in my mother's womb and it grew and it continued as she willingly and willfully sacrificed her resources in order for me to be who I am. So this should create now rahma, mercy and love for my mother. Do you see? So you could see these ayat in different ways to give you a greater sense of morality, greater sense of understanding God's wisdom, a greater sense of the fact that He deserves to be worshipped. So it's a, it's a different way of looking at the Quran. And I think this is more in line with honoring the Word of God yes. and not dishonoring it by basically superposing a reductionist empirical paradigm with some of these verses yeah. that doesn't really lead to much spirituality. It just really leads to deifying science. We deify science. We make science into a God. Now that's the yardstick. But we know it changes. We've discussed this before in previous GDM shows. And this is how the traditional scholars always looked at ayat. Yeah. Yes, there was sometimes we're referring to natural phenomena, but they would say, and God knows best, we may be wrong, for instance. 
But essentially, it was that profound wisdom and spirituality. That's how they used to look at these ayats. Uh, it just reminds me, it's almost like it does the opposite. It inflates the ego, whereas Allah is trying to humble you so you can really fulfill your purpose of creation, which is not to blow up your ego, but to break it down and understand your reality, basically. I think that was really profound. You covered it really well, mashallah. And hopefully, brothers and sisters watching this, we've been following these previous shows, can really start to now, or at least by now, start to appreciate the new narrative or the old, also the correct narrative and understand why it's just completely not only wrong, but it's just doing the Quran injustice to superimpose science on top of the Quran and try to justify the Quran why this method, which is good and great, but it's limited and it's our own human yeah, endeavor. It can basically. change, and we already discussed previously that just because it works, it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. We've just discussed all of this stuff, but essentially, to summarize from the whole show, the whole show, you know. It's, the Quranic ayat do not suffer from the limitations of induction. That's it, and that's the most beautiful way you can put it. So, Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters, for watching. I'm sure we will be doing many more shows on this particular topic. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum.